Hello everyone. Uh, this is the 11th out of 12 introductory videos uh, based on my book, Teaching in a Digital Age. Uh, I'd like to thank the Commonwealth of Learning for making these videos possible. Now, this is a very controversial topic and it's one on which I have particular views and I know these views are not shared by everyone by any means. Um, but in the book, I do go into the pros and cons of MOOCs in some detail. The aim of the 12 videos is to give a brief introduction to the main themes in the book. The book is free and online from this URL and it was enabled through BC Campus, which in British Columbia in Canada, which has an open textbook project. And this enabled me to publish my book as an open textbook. And this particular video focuses mainly on MOOCs. What is a MOOC? Well, it stands for Massive Open Online Courses. Massive because they often have thousands of students or even sometimes hundreds of thousands of students. Open because they're open to anyone. Online, um, obviously, and they're single courses. There are many kinds, but there are mainly two with lots of variations on each. Um, but the, the two are quite different. The, the first kind are what I call X MOOCs. Uh, these are main, mainly recorded lectures from top elite universities. And they're fairly behavioristic because they're mainly about content presentation. They may have automated uh, computer marked testing of memory more than anything, memory and understanding. They're offered by institutions such as uh, by uh, organizations such as Coursera and edX and FutureLearn, but the actual MOOCs themselves are made by universities uh, for, for which then are licensed, Coursera and edX are licensed to use. Um, the second kind are called connectivist MOOCs or CMOOCs and these are more like communities of practice uh, without lectures, without formal content presentation but built upon the knowledge and experience of all the participants. Most MOOCs do not have a recognized qualification. They may offer a certificate, but often that certificate isn't recognized for credit, even by the institutions that do the MOOCs. There is a move in recent years, there has been a move to micro-credentials, uh, giving small uh, recognition in the form of bad badges and so on. Uh, for MOOCs and one or two institutions have um, enabled their MOOCs to be uh, part of the first year courses that they offer. It is, but basically MOOCs are a form of continuing education and a very valuable form of continuing education. And you'll see on the right hand side, the, uh, the websites for the three main providers, Coursera, edX and FutureLearn but there are also many sites in China, India, and so on. So they have spread on, on a global basis now. What are the strengths of MOOCs? Well, they have high quality content from elite universities. They're often top professors who are given this, so the content is usually excellent. They're free, or they used to be free, but now many of the MOOC providers are uh, like Coursera, are charging a fee, but they're still much cheaper than taking a, a, paying the full uh, tuition fee from an elite university. So even though they're not all free now, they are low cost. Um, they're very good for non-formal learning. If you want to get it, become an, uh, bone up on a subject, uh, then you're getting the top people explaining it. So if you didn't know anything about artificial intelligence, this is a very good way to uh, buff up your knowledge on that. They're scalable to very large numbers. Uh, them and one of the things they've done, they got a, so much media attention that they brought online learning uh, to the attention of many people who didn't know anything about online learning, even though credit-based online courses had been in operation for nearly 15 years before MOOCs came along. 
So they forced other institutions to rethink their attitudes to online learning. However, they have a lot of weaknesses as well. They have exceedingly low participation and completion rates. The chart on the right shows that nearly half the students who register don't actually turn up or watch any of the lectures. And you'll see that when you get down to active participants, you're getting down to five to 10% of those who signed up. And of those even less complete, completion rates are around one to 5%. They're also expensive to develop. And so it's hard to know what the business model is for the institutions that make them. Um, the average cost of a MOOC is around $100,000 uh, and they're free. They, if, even if you charge a small fee, you might get your money back, but that money goes to, to, to the platforms and not to the institutions. There have been some criticisms of cultural imperialism. They came out originally from elite United States universities um, and so therefore haven't been adapted or meet necessarily the needs of developing countries. But what's happened there is that many of the developing countries have gone ahead and created their own MOOCs. So I don't think that's a very strong uh, criticism. A bigger, bigger problem is they attract the mainly well-educated. Most people who take MOOCs and certainly the ones who complete them already have a degree. And of course, another big weakness is the lack of recognition of the qualification, even by the institutions that offer them. And increasingly, the open part is coming under challenge. Uh, Coursera and uh, other platforms now have a copyright restriction that doesn't enable you to use them as open educational resources for other, other, other or other educational applications. So the original ideal of MOOCs is somewhat uh, contaminated. So in conclusion, MOOCs to some extent have been overhyped by the Ivy League of elite universities, but even more so by the American media. Nevertheless, they're still popular in many countries. There is a potential for, open for them to be used as open educational resources, but read the copyright agreement very carefully before you do. Um, XMOOCs have very good content, they're very good for comprehension and understanding, but they're very poor for skills development, mainly because there's little room for student activities or the student activities are very unfocused. There is potential for MOOCs outside the formal education system, especially the connectivist MOOCs. Connectivist MOOCs could form, for instance, one could think of a COVID-19 pandemic connectivist MOOCs where when people had a chance to reflect on what happened, they can share the different participants, such as healthcare workers, uh, people who got sick, uh, etc., could all go into the same MOOC and share their experiences and learn from each other. But MOOCs are no replacement for public systems of education or even for uh, online credit based learning. Uh, so, uh, strengths and weaknesses certainly but not a panacea. Thank you. For more information um, about MOOCs, you can go to this URL. And the next video is on emerging technologies.